Welcome to the University of Manitoba Alumni and Friends Virtual Learning for Life series, our eighth session of a total of nine weeks. My name is Tracy Bowman, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and a proud UM alumna, and will be the moderator for today's session. Thank you for joining us and making this event part of your day, and in general, for choosing to stay connected with your alma mater in this way. We've been able to offer this program free of charge to all of our 148,000 alumni living in 140 countries around the world, thanks to the very generous sponsorship of one of the U of M's affinity partners, IA Financial. Many thanks to them. Delivering learning for life opportunities is a very important role for the University of Manitoba, and we are proud that we are able to showcase so many of our leading professors and researchers in this way. Now, just a few housekeeping details before we begin. You are all on YouTube viewing this session, and you will be able to see both our presenters and their PowerPoint presentation at the same time. Today's session, like our others, is being recorded and will be posted to our website in the next day or two for later viewing. You were also sent a link to Slido, that's www.sli.do and the password, which is VL24. And that is where you will be able to enter your questions. And as we have two speakers today, we'll actually be opening up the questions, just a few questions after our first speaker presents, but then a longer Q&A session after both of our speakers present. I will be going through the, the questions on Slido and asking your questions to our speakers verbally, and we will try to get through as many as we can. So now I'd like to introduce today's speakers. They are Dr. Barry Prentice and Dr. Derek Bruin, who will be presenting on COVID-19 and the Canadian food supply chain. Dr. Derek Bruin is the head of the Department of Agribusiness and Agriculture Economics in the Faculty of Agricultural and Food Sciences. His research has focused on spatial grain and oilseed markets, as well as innovation in food processing and plant breeding. He teaches in agricultural finance, marketing, and risk management. And Dr. Barry Prentice is a professor of supply chain management in the Asper School of Business and the former director of the, of the Transport Institute. His major research and teaching interests include logistics, transportation economics, urban transport and trade policy. He is also a graduate of the University of Manitoba. So with that, over to you, Dr. Prentice and Dr. Bruin. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to have a chance to discuss uh, this uh, very important topic area of uh, food resilience and weaknesses in the supply chain and what's been exposed by COVID-19. I'm going to speak mainly about the food processing sector and beyond towards the consumer. And my colleague, uh, Derek, will be talking more about the agricultural farm side and, and the production of uh, food products. So uh, to begin with sort of the impacts of the food system and individuals. Uh, uh, clearly, we all know by now that COVID doesn't just uh, appear magically. It has to be passed from one person to another. So obviously, where you have more people uh, together or more people meeting, then you have a greater risk of, of some kind of tra uh, transmission or, or infection. Uh, we can divide the food system into two groups, therefore. We have frontline workers on the one side, uh, those who are involved in the direct distribution, supermarkets and convenience stores, and then people who are in the food service industry, as you can see, restaurants, bars, and sporting events. In fact, it's interesting just to note, uh, as we have gone into this shutdown, how many things have been affected and, of course, where food is available, uh, uh, including even those uh, uh, trucks on the streets. Uh, my understanding is a pierogi truck is now parked somewhere near us permanently, and uh, I guess if you like uh, that, it's uh, your chance. Uh, the other side, the processing and logistics workers, obviously, uh, in the different areas, food processing, and you can divide that into field crops, livestock products, and horticulture. And then the warehousing side of long-term and, and distribution centers, and then finally logistics, both local and long distance. So in looking at this split of, of uh, people, we can see that obviously all the frontline workers are, are most affected. And indeed, uh, the uh, hotel, so the food service industry was basically shut down uh, to prevent transmission and of course the retail stores were uh, very much changed in order to accommodate uh, people's need to actually still buy food. On the processing side, 
Uh, the field crops, by and large, are fairly highly automated and, and spread out facilities, like a, a canola crushing plant. So there's not a whole lot of risk involved in, in those operations. Uh, livestock products came up, uh, obviously, uh, as a, a problem area, and we saw transmission uh, in the beef packing plants, as well as pork and chicken across the country in different places. So that's because people are in close proximity and there's lots of them. Horticulture is kind of a strange one because there's not a lot of processing of, uh, of a tomato that's grown in a, a greenhouse. It's simply sized and packaged and, and sent to the, to the market. So it's kind of a production process uh, all in one. But that's also where, of course, we see a lot of people that are working in confined areas. And so the horticultural area, and especially with, uh, with foreign uh, guest workers, have become uh, an issue that's uh, shown up uh, over this period. On warehousing, not a lot of problems. Uh, by and large, the distribution centers have more people, uh, but they gain, uh, they don't interact with many people from the outside. So unless somebody in that group has a problem, uh, you're not going to get transmission. Uh, with regard to logistics and transport, uh, local is fairly safe. Long distance is uh, obviously a, a concern, and we have had some instances of truck drivers who have contracted the disease. And in fact, I think it's rather remarkable and wonderful that we haven't seen more, uh, given that they have to go into many areas where we know COVID-19 is, is quite prominent. Uh, in terms of the processing sector and its uh, question of resilience and vulnerabilities, uh, one of the, the, the trends we've seen over the last uh, decades is that we get bigger and bigger facilities. And of course, economies of size are driving this. So specialization of production, you get increased efficiencies. And, and so therefore, uh, there's a, a trend to do that because you're lowering costs and you outcompete the smaller facilities. Uh, also a case of location in order to minimize costs of raw materials and, and or to distribution of products, they tend to be located in, in fairly concentrated areas. So in the, the beef packing uh, uh, industry is a good example where it's located in Southern Alberta, uh, but also we'll see uh, various plants uh, that are located in areas, uh, for example, processing of milk would be located in an area where you have a lot of milk processing. Uh, Quebec would be a good example of that. Uh, bigger processors obviously have an opportunity to serve world markets better. They can have the reach, they can lower their costs, and, and they can expand sales, which is, of course, good for all of us. And the bigger facilities also have more opportunities for automation and technical improvement. So there's a, a lot of benefits to size. And indeed, one might argue or think that being big might actually give you more resilience in some respects because uh, you can spend more money on uh, on uh, sanitation and so on. Of course, on the other side, concentration has revealed vulnerabilities. Uh, Labor-intensive processes, uh, they're, if we're in the future, we're going to do it this way, then we're probably going to demand more space. And, and that's a problem because uh, the people are fairly close together and trying to have shields and, and do this is is obviously uh, an issue and of course it affects the whole layout of these plants so that is a, a problematic issue. Uh, there is uh, clearly some problem that arises when you have a shutdown if you have a, a bigger share of the market then more consumers are affected and, and prices are likely affected more quickly if that's the case. Uh, the disruption to suppliers is also larger and we saw this where uh, a cheese plant uh, closes because someone had came in who, who was infected and therefore all of a sudden you have milk having to be dumped because what else are you going to do with it? Uh, I will leave those comments more to my colleague, uh, Dr. Bruin, to, to speak to. Uh, so finally, we could say that specialization risk uh, offers more instability. If you are more specialized, for example, in just serving the wholesale trade uh, or the hotel restaurant trade, we find out that when they shut down, uh, you have a lot more risk. And it's not always easy to make these changes. Uh, the French fry producers uh, uh, producing large bags of frozen French fries for the for the restaurants uh, all of a sudden found themselves with no market because that those are hard to move into a retail space when the, when the food and beverage industry goes away. So specialization will also increase uh, more vulnerability. 
in terms of the transportation side, uh, it's pretty resilient. Uh, it's an extremely large number of suppliers, truck, intermodal rail, and air. And as a result of that, uh, just having more spread out, there's less chance of, of some kind of uh, spread or contraction. Similarly, the, the distribution centers are well placed out. And again, we haven't seen many problems there. Uh, the speed of adjustment is pretty quick. Uh, when there is a problem, obviously these are mobile uh, facilities and therefore you can uh, move things around fairly quickly or isolate uh, problems. And uh, part of this home uh, resilience has been now home delivery. So uh, we also can uh, limit the amount that people have to actually leave their homes and uh, be exposed to a problem. Uh, in terms of vulnerability, uh, there is threat to the frontline workers. Again, uh, the truck drivers had some pretty tough uh, uh, weeks where uh, they couldn't buy a meal on the road. Uh, they, they couldn't get a shower. Uh, the truck stops were closed. And, and so that is something that had to change. And of course, they're, they are under threat uh, in terms of how they uh, operate. You know, the, the whole notion of how do you hand the documents to somebody when you're not supposed to open the window in your cab? Uh, so these sorts of things had to be worked out and, and uh, uh, of course, keep the people safe. Uh, we do have vulnerability with dependence on trade. Uh, we import virtually all our fresh produce uh, year round. And of course, we've been very fortunate that the borders have stayed open. Those production zones have continued to operate. We've had trucks. We haven't had much problem, but uh, certainly, that is an area where if that's shut off, we, we certainly will run out of lettuce very quickly. Uh, export markets for meat and grains, again, uh, we depend on those. We produce much more than we, can, than we uh, consume. And again, Dr. Bruning will speak to that. But we have this dependence, so there's a vulnerability uh, on that side. And of course, within that is the question of thickening of the borders. Uh, as uh, people become more aware of the problems and, and want to test more. Uh, the time to get across the border slows. Maybe some of the things that cross the border cannot cross uh, ourselves at this moment. So there is vulnerability that, that goes with that uh, as well. Uh, in terms of the impacts, and I'd like to speak to, the, to some of them. Uh, obviously, uh, like wars, the pandemic is going to usher in new practices. Things that that were operating perhaps at a low level uh, will suddenly become uh, much more popular mainstream. And the model that you can see to the left uh, looks at product life cycle stages. In most products, there's an introduction stage and, and things expand very, very slowly. And for most services and products, they never get past this tipping point. Uh, the tipping point is when you move from slow sales to very rapid sales and growth. Again, if you get past that point, then your business is probably going to grow and continue to grow for some time. But most uh, operations never get there. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing because of the pandemic is home delivery of food. And a number of companies are, are jumping into this, Amazon, Walmart, as well as uh, other local people. Uh, and of course, as consumers, we're now getting more used to the idea of ordering things online and, and having them delivered. So what was the service that was out there, but it was only really successful in a few places, New York, London, and some of the bigger cities were able to work, but it didn't spread very far, may now uh, find a, a much broader application. So one of the good uh, news or good things about this uh, event was that we're going to get perhaps a lot more home delivery. Given that there is a fairly large shut-in population, uh, there is a base market for this service, but just to get the mass to make it actually economic, uh, perhaps this is what was required. Uh, health and food safety obviously is now very much top of mind. Uh, I guess so less sharing economy, if that's what we want to call a buffet. I know they've banned them on the ocean cruises already. Uh, this may be something that is going away and uh, will not come back uh, just simply because of, of concern. Uh, I think people already had concerns, but uh, we didn't really worry too much about it. We just uh, took our chances. Uh, perhaps now we're not going to see uh, buffets come back quite as much. Uh, more packaging. 
uh, fruits and vegetables, these clamshells. So we'd like to get rid of packaging, re reduce packaging. But if people are worried about who's touched my tomatoes and, and then, you know, I'm touching them and so on, uh, maybe we'll see more packaging. Of course, you still have to touch the packaging, but that's another issue. Uh, the last is this issue of stricter distancing. Uh, you can see in the bottom slide, that's a, a, a picture of one of the uh, meat processing plants. And of course, people are really close together. Again, how you'd have shields between them and still operate is, is not clear. And of course, uh, the stores now have these plastic uh, sneeze guards, like they're called, uh, in front of them. And uh, no doubt they're going to stay. Uh, I don't know if that's really a good thing, personally. I, I always like the more personal space, and I think most people do, but uh, we're likely going to see that uh, in many places uh, besides just in, in food service. Uh, so what does this all mean? Well, one of the things it might mean in terms of this you know, meat packing is it could be more incentive to develop uh, automated uh, systems to actually do some of that meat cutting uh, and uh, and reduce the, the threat. And I suspect that will be one of the outcomes. Uh, I'd like to say life goes on, uh, but habits change. Well, the life goes on, I think when this is over in a couple of years, uh, the world in many ways is going to look very much like it did before this happened. Uh, we're still going to go to sporting events and people will still want to travel uh, to the to the south for a week or so if they get a chance and and uh, do things. I don't think we're going to see us giving up on a lot of the things which have been suspended at the moment, but certain habits are likely to change. Uh, one of them is a presentation we're doing right now, uh, working from home and, and being able to use uh, uh, the internet to do webinars and, and communicate much more so than uh, in the past. And, and that is something that for some of us at least, is likely going to persist. Uh, there will be maybe a, a combination of working at home and coming into an office, uh, but it may well reconfigure the way offices are, are set up. Uh, this will have an impact obviously on the, the hotel, or sorry, the restaurant uh, and service industry because people working from home are gonna be eating at home too. Uh, the good news I suppose is making uh, more Meals at home, maybe eating a bit healthier. The, the bad news is maybe we'll be spending a lot more and burning a lot more fuel to have people deliver uh, meals to our home. But I don't think uh, uh, we're going to see us go back to the way we were. Uh, some of these habits are changing and, and they will affect the, the food industry. Uh, this is my last slide. Uh, I think the one of the biggest impacts of COVID-19 is what I would consider the the end of innocence. Uh, we now feel a lot more vulnerable to these sorts of events that are happening. And you know, we can see how people react to the hoarding of, uh, of food and toilet paper. Uh, imagine what would happen if we had a, a much more calamitous event where we have actual crop failures uh, because of, of climate change. Are we prepared in any way to deal with these things or even for that matter with the next pandemic? So I think the one thing that is coming out of this is that uh, we aren't going to be feeling quite as self-secure in terms of our systems and how they work. And we'll be uh, looking more at early warning systems and, and perhaps, uh, of course, uh, the good news in this may be uh, speeding up the development of vaccines and other things which are happening. But I, I do believe that uh, the, the public in general is now more concerned about you know our, our total uh, society welfare than we were in the past. Uh, with that, uh, I will stop and uh, return back to our uh, our moderator. Thank you so much. We've had uh, one question come in um, right now, and so um, I'll just ask that. And, and uh, Dr. Prentice, you can let me know if this question is better for you or for Dr. Bruin. Um, the question is, why as a country have we not invested in the infrastructure of hydroponics so that we can create our own fresh fruit and vegetables in all parts of the country? Well, that's a good question. And, and it's certainly one that we have uh, seen investments in. I, I, you know, I mentioned lettuce. I probably shouldn't have. I should have used some other uh, fruit because there are vertical growing walls now with the uh, lettuces and small greens. So we are doing that hydroponically. 
and certainly there's a lot of efforts to try and come up with something for the north, uh, it really comes down to the question of economics. Uh, is it less expensive to uh, produce that way or is it less expensive to have field production and, and truck it to us? Uh, and obviously there's also a question of, of how much can you really do practically? Uh, I don't see a, a future of growing bananas hydroponically in Canada, but certainly uh, other products that we do now in, in large quantities, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, and so on, uh, I see that continuing. Oh, okay, thank you. Another question has just come in um, on long haul trucking. Uh, the question is, with long haul trucking being more challenged by COVID-19, will there be a shift in the road rail cusp for some commodities or will wants shift us back? No, I believe that we're, we're very unlikely to see a big shift from truck to rail, uh, principally because of the routes uh, and the rail lines where they run. The railways tend to run east and west and the fruits and vegetables uh, that we obtain are running north-south. So uh, the major import points from Mexico are Nogales and McCallum. Nogales in Arizona and McCallum in Texas. And of course, California and Florida are, are two major spots. They're not really well served by rail uh, from Canada. And there's also a question of time. Uh, these are perishable products and uh, every day counts. And uh, the railways, although they're getting better over time, they're still not reliable. In fact, the railways will refuse to even accept perishables because they don't want to run the risk of the claims that go with it. So it's going to be trucks for a long time to come. Okay, thank you. And one last question before we turn it over to Dr. Bruin. The question is, do you foresee any shifts in the wholesale space with economic pressure on smaller players? Ah, shift in the wholesale space as in the distribution centers, or I'm not sure I understand uh, the, the, the nature of the question. Um, in the wholesale space, uh, that's all that's here. Yeah, well, again, you know, we, we do have quite a diversity of, of wholesales. Obviously, the chain stores have their own uh, distribution centers, but you do have people like Pratt's uh, who serve all of uh, you know, many of the rural uh, grocery stores or small mom and pop type operations are served from Pratt's, as well as, of course, uh, Cisco and Pratt's serve the, the restaurant hotel trade. So we do have quite a diversification in the, in the wholesale distribution. Uh, it isn't just chain stores. Okay, thank you. So I'd encourage everybody to keep your questions coming, but I think right now we're going to turn it over to Dr. Bruin and then we'll have a, a, a longer Q&A afterwards. Hi everybody. Uh, this is uh, Derek Bruin call, calling, talking to you from virtual space. Very interesting way to do a presentation, and I appreciate the invitation from the alumni uh, folks. And uh, I am going to talk more about the the farm side of uh, the the uh, weaknesses and resilience of our supply chain. And I think the farm side really starts with the overall endowment of um, of agricultural arable land in Canada. So this is where the arable land is in Canada. And you can see a very high concentration in the prairie provinces. We actually, uh, the, about 85% of all the arable land is in the three prairie provinces. And um, the growing area that we're in uh, across the globe at this uh, um, medians, we, we're, we tend to grow a lot of uh, spring cereals and and oil seeds so we grow a lot of wheat and uh, canola but i just to point out how much more arable land we have than normal uh so we have about 12 times as much arable land per person as china about four times as much as the us by some measures we have 40 times more than the average citizen of the world so we are sitting on a huge endowment of this pro productive arable land and because of where we are, it tends to be uh, focused on uh, grains and oil seeds. So we produce about 87 million tons of grains and oil seeds, uh, which produces about 20 million tons of flour, 9 million tons of canola, 20 million tons of feed for beef, pork, uh, dairy, and uh, chicken and, and egg producers. So we produce a lot more than what we what we need from that initial endowment, which gets to 
some of the concerns that, that Dr. Prentice has raised about trade. Uh, because the focus is really on that land base and most of that land base is based on the grain supply chain, I'm gonna go more into detail of that partly because I know more about it as well, but I, I do want to touch about this. So this is the the uh, Canadian grain uh, supply chain in eight pitches. So uh, the, this uh, uh, tractor at the green tractor at the bottom is uh, air seeder putting the crop in the ground. In this happens in mid to late May, and so it was happening as our country was going into lockdown. Farmers were essentially going out into the to the crop land and seeding it, and they had already purchased most of what they needed to put the crop in the ground, including fertilizer and pesticides that they might apply later on in the summer. And after that goes in the ground, we face this random weather throughout uh, the prairies of Canada. But in general, we've been having pretty good crops lately. Uh, the crop ripens in, in August, that's a combine taking the crop off. And this is, I think, a grain car that's been already loaded up from the, from the, from the uh, combine loading onto a truck and then the truck hauls the grain to bins on the farm or directly to the elevators and so this is the top corner this is a truck loading grain dumping grain into a, a pit at an elevator and the elevator lifts the grain up in the air puts it into a, a rail car and in this supply chain rail movement is by far the most economical uh, and most of this grain will move by rail, even if it's moving to domestic uh, processors. But a lot of it is moved through the Rocky Mountains. This is a uh, Rocky Mountain uh, movement of grain, and that's uh, um, for, to the far right is a uh, terminal in Vancouver, the Viterra terminal, where the uh, rail cars unload. They lift it up in the air and put it onto boats. And our main, one of our main customers for all that production are export buyers who are buying it free on board on boats in Vancouver. So I, that, that tends to be one of the major, major economic draws that manages our grain and oil seeds uh, supply chains. Now, because it's such a big endowment and because it's what most farmers, like uh, the majority, the, the, not the majority, but the most types of farmers, the typology of farms with the biggest numbers is uh, grains and oil seeds. And there are a lot of people doing it, a lot of value that's related to it. And even on uh, the, the use of our grains and oil seeds, a bunch of it goes into the livestock sector. So even the livestock sector is very interested in what happens to our crops supply and disposition. And so the uh, uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada does uh, regular estimates of what's going on, on our uh, in our supply chains. And the last one they did was May 20, 22nd, and some idea of COVID was in place, but they really, you know, the details of what might change within the supply chain uh, had not been fleshed out in great detail, but I actually think that they're not too far off in terms of what they forecasted. And the big thing is that they're actually forecasting our total production of grains and oil seeds to be about the same in 2020 as it was in 2019. Uh, I'll just point out that uh, we we use these funny double years when we look at crops because even though the crop went into the ground in May of 2020, we count the crop year as when the, the, the harvest is taken off. And then for the next year, we take that stored grain in bins in, on farms and export it and move it to domestic processors. And then we have some left over. It's carry out stocks and it goes until uh, July of the year. So this even the second line, 2019-2020 uh, 20, is an estimate up to July of 2020 in terms of what they're doing with exports and uh, our own domestic use. Okay, so we have th around 35 million hectares of farmland. Uh, you can see that about 30 million are used up in grains and oil seeds and pulses and specialty crops, a whole bunch of that uh, in the Western Canada, but two crops, uh, wheat and canola uh, tend to be the together they use up uh, more than half or close to half of the total area of seed of grains and oil seeds. And uh, what I wanted to mention here was that we weren't expecting much shift in area from either of those crops. And especially in wheat, we weren't expecting much change in price. I think they might have been a little bullish on canola prices. Uh, I think they, they, they were thinking in, in, in May of 2022 20, that there was actually 
a, a bit of a demand uh, or a shortage worldwide of oil seeds. And so they were actually looking at higher prices for canola in, in May of this year. But in general, the overall grain and, and uh, oil seeds uh, producing part of the supply chain, there doesn't look to be as a big of, uh, impact on on the supply chain as, a, as there will be, as, as there was in some of the other supply chains, but overall pretty good returns relative to last year for 2020 and 2021. Okay, this is the overall supply chain. I got all the players and some of the large crops that are growing. So there's about 63,000 farms. There's more grain farmers, but 63,000 uh, actual units. We produce about 32 million tons of wheat around 20 million tons of canola, and uh, it moves through grain handling firms, a, a bunch of them that have their, their main offices here in Winnipeg. Uh, railways are a very important part of the supply chain. We do process uh, quite a bit of wheat, and about half of the canola we produce is processed here in Canada. Uh, but even of that processed canola, a bunch of it is converted into oil that is also exported. M majority of that is exported. So we are very reliant on exporters. And just in terms of the seeds, we export about 71% of the wheat we produce, about half of the canola we produce, and then another big portion of the oil we produce from the canola we do process, and then about 30% of the barley. So the barley and that 13 million tons of corn, which most of it is grown in, in southern um, Ontario, those things feed into our livestock sector, and so does the, the meal from the canola that's not used for oil and the meal from the soybeans that is not used for oil. So moving on to the main livestock supply chain. So the second largest group of farms is the beef uh, sector. We have about 36,000 beef farms in Canada. They have about 4 million uh, cows on beef farms, another 1 million on, on dairy farms, and they produce about 4 million head of calves each year. We uh, produce about 1.3 billion kilograms of beef and we export about a third of the beef that we make here in Canada and about 17% of the animals that are grown here move into the U.S. market. The Canadian Food Inspection Agency is keeping track, especially of things that are happening in the packing plant and the export area. This is the pork supply chain. So a smaller total female breeding herd of sows, but produce more animals. And eventually we produce more pork than we produce beef. 21 billion kilograms of pork, about 20, 22 million heads slaughtered. And we also export about 60% of the pork that we produce, about 20% of the live animals are exported. And again, Canada Food Inspection Agency uh, government monitors of that, uh, that supply chain. And then I do want to me mention the dairy sector, which the, the calves from, uh, there's about 10,000 uh, dairy farmers, so the third largest grouping of uh, farmers in Canada. Um, they produce uh, three, sorry, 7.5 billion liters of milk, but almost all of it is consumed domestically. And I think uh, we have seen that the supply, some supply managed sectors, when they're faced with shocks, like we, we did see a grain price shock in 2008, these got the, the supply chain, uh, supply managed supply chains, could respond relatively quickly to a price change on the input side. And we saw a little bit less, uh, you know, bankrupt firms and, and dropping in the number of farms just because they're going out of business. The beef sector suffered a lot when we had the BSE event and then followed it with high grain prices. And this is the chicken market, another uh, well, 4,400 4, firms involved in growing chicken and eggs. and uh, we, have, we do produce uh, quite a lot of chicken as well, not quite as much as beef and not nearly as much as pork, but we do export a small amount of it now, or about 15%, hardly any of our eggs are uh, exported. So I wanted to get to similar slides to Barry on the overall resilience of our supply chain and our vulnerabilities. And I, I think that the huge endowment we have of arable land is a place where we have you know, surplus capacity, and it's part of our resilience in terms of our overall supply of agricultural goods. And it does give us options to use that land differently to grow biofuels. And we could use less total inputs on the, the, the land, especially that would happen if prices really dropped and it didn't pay to put as much fertilizer on, uh, we would uh, 
we would see less input use and we saw some of that in when uh, grain prices were quite a bit lower in the early 2000s. And then that huge endowment and, and uh, land also gives us natural geographic dispersion of our grain farms for certain types of disease patterns. And it also we could use it as we should use it for our livestock sector because we can spread those animals and their manure, which is valuable nutrients to the um, grain sector across more land. And then I think we have a very engaged public sector, partly because we've always been worried about uh, weather shocks to the ag sector. We have stabilization systems set up within the federal government and provincial governments that uh, subsidize crop insurance that make uh, it less risky for farmers and we, it leads to some uh, investment in agriculture that might not happen if we didn't have those processes. And then another very important, I, I feel a very important public sector engagement is in the value chain roundtables. This really came out of the BSE event in beef where they saw that when the entire supply chain is private, we sometimes need to break down some, some walls so that we can communicating up and down the supply chain to point out any big threats to the overall supply chain. And so the federal government has set up these value chain roundtables for all the major sectors that I just went through. And it does uh, lead to um, kind of a coordinated approach for a bunch of those supply chains. There was actually a value chain roundtable specifically for the COVID events. And I do think that they flagged some of those concerns that Barry was talking about in terms of truckers and getting truckers across the US border to facilitate our own exports of some of our pork and beef and even some of our grains, and then also moving a whole bunch of the food that we consume in our grocery stores that comes uh, from the south into the north. And then I do think that because we have this huge excess uh, capacity to produce agriculture goods, we face big threats if there was any kind of trade disruption. So again, back to Barry's thicker border where it's costly to move across borders. And that's sort of a, a very, um, it's a, it hurts both producers and consumers. When we get that thicker border, the supply chain becomes more expensive. The producer can end up uh, the consumer sees such a high price they decrease demand leads to less returns on the farm and higher prices in, in for consumers which is it's, it's especially a tough thing and it's kind of a push for that economies of scale we've seen in processing that Barry was talking about that that pressure that we can see that's actually negative for both the producers and the consumers when it gets too costly to distribute and um, and uh, process food then I do think that local supply and I, I think it's totally reasonable i think it was pretty common after the world wars that everybody was concerned to have enough calories grown in their country so that uh, we were we could feed ourselves that's not a concern even our our ending stocks would, of grains and oil seeds could probably feed all of canada for a year uh, but i i think um, you know it's absolutely fair that some countries are going to focus on this because they saw disruption they saw uh, panicked consumers worried about having enough and uh, so I think we could get, see a rise in demand for local supplies and that could lead to trade disruptions and it was absolutely in effect before all this started that uh, the uh, government of India was worried about producing enough of their own pulses created some tariffs that hurt the Canadian pulse sector because um, it was such a big buyer of our products and then we absolutely saw some processing uh, vulnerability short run in the plants, the beef plants and pork plants across North America, where you very showed those folks working right beside each other. There was a lot of transfer of COVID disease there, though there was also even uh, some concern that they, their housing for some of the people in uh, in some of the places in Canada where they were, they were too close. I'm talking about beef processing workers that were living, a whole bunch of them living in the same house so that the, the uh, and, and partly they were doing that because their wages were maybe not high enough. That led to some transfer of the COVID disease. So there's absolutely concern about uh, processing there. And that could lead to, you know, danger pay for those people that are working in that those conditions, increasing the cost of the supply chain. And also we had periodic uh, shutdowns of some of those processing plants. And again, when that happens, there's a shortage of the meat that was coming out of the plant. So the prices of the uh, final products were going up because there was sometimes one of you know our plants uh, three plants control um, 
90% of the beef production in Canada, one plant goes down, you lose 30% of your supply. That's a drastic drop in supply of beef. So we saw increases in the price of beef, but at the same time, that plant wasn't taking in the animals. So the value of those animals went down. So again, it hurts both producers and consumers when we see a problem in that processing sector. Okay, I, I do want to flag some work done by the Canadian ag economists across Canada. We had a Canadian Journal of Agricultural Economics special issue. Our own uh, Ryan Cardwell at the University of Manitoba was one of the editors. And myself and Dr. Chad Lawley have articles in this special issue. But you, it's free online for the next few months. Uh, you can see what some of our uh, people across Canada have worked on. And this has um, some food security uh, articles, uh, more, more discussion of some of the stuff Barry went through in terms of the food supply chain. And then there were uh, discussions of each of the major commodities um, in, in this, in this uh, special issue. And finally, I do want to thank uh, all of the public sources of data that are collected in Canada that make our analysis of these supply chains reasonable. Like we, we would really be working blind if we didn't have some of the data sources we have, especially from Stats Canada, uh, and the Canadian Grain Commission and the, uh, Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada on, on the grain side that really, really help us understand that uh, supply chain. All right, that's that's it for me. I hope I'm close on time. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, so now we will open up the Q&A to both of our speakers today. So if a few more questions have come in. So I encourage you, please uh, type away and ask, ask as many questions as you'd like as we do have some time. Um, so the, the first uh, the first question is, what are your thoughts regarding the amount of arable land and growing season as a result of climate change? Any forecasts available? Uh, actually, I did look into this uh, with regard to the what's called the uh, uh, the clay belt in Ontario. Uh, most people aren't aware that there's a, a stretch of land in northern Ontario that is actually as big as the entire agricultural area of Manitoba uh, and plus. Uh, and it's a very similar origin. It was a lake bottom. Uh, the difficulty is, of course, that it's further uh, north. It, well, in Canada, the the weather doesn't just travel north-south. It's actually northwest southeast. So Edmonton's warmer than Winnipeg. And, and of course, uh, Winnipeg is warmer than Kapuskasing. So that clay belt in Northern Ontario has been really cold and, and difficult to, to farm and only a small part of it has opened up. But in looking at the climate predictions, uh, they're suggesting that within 30 years, uh, that area could have a climate very similar to Manitoba. So we could have an area of, of agricultural production and quite fertile land as big as we have in Manitoba today. And that would be a big significant change. Yeah, I, I think I think climate change has already started to affect some of the uh, production we've seen. I think uh, um, I heard it in a in a visionary uh, visionary speeches uh, discussion. Um, and uh, carbon dioxide is actually food for plants. And as we've seen increased carbon dioxide, we might have seen higher yields in places where it's not so hot that it's it's not productive anymore. Like we don't want so much heat that it. It's a desert or a drought. Uh, one of the things that has, is a, a possibility under climate change, and it's sort of happening just on the innovation side uh, in terms of plant breeding, that we could see more canola, or sorry, corn and uh, soybeans moving into the places where we're currently growing wheat and canola. That more corn tends to make livestock the more uh, useful use of that arable land, and I'm not sure the world wants that, but if they paid us enough, we'd move back to different types of uh, wheat. But I do think it. I think it. I think it's actually having an impact on yields already, and I think it could have an impact on yeah, some of the land opening up, and then some of the uses of the current land changing. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is: What lessons have we learned regarding fresh fruits and vegetables so we could be food independent? independent, plus not subject to currency and political instability? Well, that's a tough one. I'm not sure uh, that we have uh, really learned that much. Uh, we have seen over time a very dramatic increase in greenhouse uh, production. 
Uh, in fact, Canada is now a major exporter of tomatoes to the U.S., which I, I find rather ironic. Uh, of course, it's all greenhouse coming out of Leamington, Ontario, in that area. Uh, and, and there is certainly more work going on. I guess we can thank the cannabis producers for stimulating more of that type of production inside uh, with different lighting and, and, and just the effort to try and grow crops within uh, buildings as opposed to out in fields. Uh, the one thing you do get, of course, is much greater control, and you do save the transportation costs, but the energy has to come from somewhere. It's not necessarily clear to me that you necessarily have less uh, carbon emissions because of that, depending on what you're using to, to heat these buildings, and there's still lots of transport from them anyway. But uh, we are, uh, you know, working this way. Uh, one of the things that I found quite remarkable and, and uh, news to me is about half of the tomatoes coming out of Mexico are now coming out of greenhouses in Mexico. You think, well, why do they have greenhouses? You know, they, they don't need to worry about the cold and they don't, but it's just that quality control. People buy with their eyes. They want that perfect tomato as opposed to one with a little scar on it. And so, you know, the, the greenhouse production uh, appeals more to quality control. And that's probably one of the major pushes. Well, I, I think the question is sort of implying that we have to have fresh vegetables and fruits as part of our um, independence. And, you know, I, there are actually, you know, places in the world where, you know, people are living on bags of rice and bags of beans. You know, they are, that, that is a, you, you, you are independent in terms of total calories. Uh, you just don't really like your choices that much. I, to me, for us to expect to, to move to kind of complete uh, independence on all the different things that we consume, it's not, it's it's unreasonable given if we're going to continue to be exporters of uh, commodities ourselves. I, I, to me, it's not kind of um, consistent policy, but I think it's reasonable to have the first thing where you, you have enough calories to survive, and that is, that is sort of the policy of a lot of European countries, but I don't think it's, um, you know, I don't think it's really fair for a country that plans to export a bunch of agricultural goods to plan to be independent on all of its own food supply. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great points. It's right. um, Give up avocados. I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the next question is, how likely are we to see a rise in smaller local meat plants? Uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting question. Uh, one of the greatest limitations is the, uh, is the health inspection. And, you know, we do have provincially inspected plants and federally inspected plants. Uh, the, you cannot move meat across the provincial border unless it comes from a federally inspected plant. Uh, I don't know as much about this as I really like to, but I do know that the, re, the requirements for federal inspection are much higher. And so that does limit some of the production that we would see that in smaller plants, it's really just the cost and Again, there's, there's lots of details on this that anyone can find out about uh, or talk to someone in the industry, but I don't really see a lot of hope for a lot of smaller plants just because of that. I, you know, I think this, this uh, is really up to the consumer. Like we, we see microbreweries having a, a, a comeback because it's sort of a, a thing that people care about. Uh, there might have been a, a modest amount of regulatory differences. And there was also, also there was, I think Barry's talked about this too, that, that automation can make the economies of scale less important to some sectors. So if we get certain types of technical advances in meat processing, we could maybe see uh, some of these uh, smaller operations be more viable. And I would like to, by the way, put in a plug for the Bow Brothers who grow grass-fed beef in uh, Dougald, Manitoba. They're, that's a great product. And, local healthy uh, supply, but I don't think they could give us all of our beef. I don't think they have that much production, so get yours in soon. But I, I actually think that the economies of scale in our big beef plants are what drove this and a, and a demand for, you know, these cheap burgers that we're getting at fast food restaurant. That's kind of driving a whole bunch of the beef supply chain. And I don't know if that's really going to change. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Another question is, in your opinion, what is the Achilles heel of our food system that we aren't paying attention to? Well, I, I, I think that some of our livestock production, we have 
concentration in, say, the Fraser Valley of BC, and even, I don't think it's serious, but there's some concentration of the hot sector in southern southeastern Manitoba. The, the disease for the livestock sector, we saw what it did in China, like the, uh, the swine, swine fever in China wiped out all this herd, and I think that, that disease in the livestock sector, I think it's a very important concern. And I do think that we could get pro prolonged droughts under climate change that we don't really, you know, we haven't got the models well enough figured out to know whether or not that's the case. We saw one in Australia, though. If we get a prolonged drought, that's another you know, serious uh, threat to our current production. And it, it, that not only hurts all these grain farmers, it's all the livestock sector that relies on their other the, the coarse grains that come out of their production. I would agree with that completely. Okay. And another question is, where would you suggest investment dollars or best place moving to forward in the agriculture and food supply chains? If it were a year or two ago, I'd have said cannabis production, but I'm not so sure now because they're laying people off and I don't know what's going on there. Um, I guess, you know, some of the uh, crops which are developing, uh, the veggie burger obviously is leading uh, away and we're using more peas for that. Uh, but we are also using hemp uh, in processes. So I think some of these uh, foods that are going into what I would call manufactured uh, products uh, are more likely to grow. And so that's probably one case. Um, offhand, I can't think of anything particular because we, we're getting pretty much uh, creatures of habit. You know, we like to eat certain foods and we repeat that. We, we don't go out and, and go too experimental usually. Yeah, I, I hazard to, to pick an investment in the agriculture su supply chain, partly because a whole bunch of the, the easy investments were made years ago. You know, like a bunch of our supply chains have been worked out to be pretty efficient and there's not lots left to fight over. And I think the real money is is in the person who identifies that new need from the consumer. And uh, I think Barry and I will both agree that we don't understand uh, consumers that well. <laughs> But if you, as an investor, understand the trend in the, in the consumption, I think that might be worth investing in. Well, speaking of consumption, something I remember seeing on the news was uh, how reliant we are or how, uh, how reliant restaurants are on potatoes and that with restaurants being shut down, the, uh, I mean, no one's getting, no one's ordering French fries, right? And what are they still supposed to do? What are farmers supposed to do with all of these potatoes, right? Yeah. So that was, that was very interesting to me. Yeah, again, it comes back to this uh, a specialization. You know, the at one time everybody grew everything, but now you're not. You're specialized in producing potatoes and having storages and so on. Uh, I guess on the one side, the, the COVID, if it had to come, it came at a good time because uh, the potato crop was hit pretty hard at, at harvest. So we were actually looking at a shortage of potatoes. Uh, it probably won't occur now because uh, people didn't go to restaurants and eat them. I, I think potatoes, well, actually, there is a big investment in, in uh, the equipment for potato processing, but the land itself can and is normally part of a rotation with a grain farm. So the land that's being used for potatoes can move to other uses. That uh, Those potato harvesting e in equipment in investments, those are a little bit harder to deal with. And that supply chain, the potato supply chain, was really managed a lot by the processors who would contract with producers and so some of that can get worked out with the contracts, but I do think that when if we lose demand like that, that some of the farmers who are banking on those contracts are going to suffer from the loss of those contracts. On some of the other types of, uh, you know, I'm not an expert in horticulture to, to much of an extent, but especially some of the orchards in BC uh, and some of the longer term um, rotation crops, something like ginseng that's in the ground for quite a long time, those guys are kind of stuck with a commodity that might not get used. Uh, and that's very expensive, you know, to hold on to it. If there's no market for it to keep that land around or, or keep those, those products around is, is expensive. And so we do see this weird thing where we're, you know, these farmers have produced something and they're just letting it rot or milk's getting spread on the ground or, or hog farmers are killing uh, weanlings because it's expensive to keep some of the production that they've, they've, uh, made and there's also like a thousand little stories of problems uh i have a friend who's a cherry grower 
in BC and they sell a lot of their cherries to uh, Asia. But now there's not as many uh, flights. There's not the belly space that would allow them to ship the cherries in, on the passenger aircraft. And of course, it's about three or four times more expensive on dedicated aircraft. So suddenly their cherry business doesn't look very uh, financially solvent anymore. Uh, this comes out of the blue. You know, we're going to get these kind of events that, that just come along and, and hit us. Uh, uh, hopefully people have the resources to, to last long enough to get back to normal. Yes, yeah, so many things that, you know, if we're not uh, experts in the industry like the both of you are, things that you just don't think about in, in you know, where our food is coming from, the supply chain management of it when we are in a situation like this. So, um, you know, all great points. So I'll just put out another last call to see if there's any questions. But in the meantime, uh, Dr. Brune and Dr. Prentice, is there any last words that you want to share with us in terms of, you know, what you predict the next six months to look like, you know, in terms of the Canadian uh, agricultural industry or the food industry or any advice in terms of where we should be buying or or who we should be supporting uh, in terms of where we buy our groceries? Really, there. You know, let's just hope we get back to normal as soon as possible. The the greatest concern I think we all have is the possibility of the second wave, and uh, you know, knocking everything back again uh, to where it might have been. Uh, in some ways, you know, changes like this can be very good. You know, it gives us a chance to sit back and reflect at what's important and, and things we took for for granted that maybe we shouldn't have, uh, but. My guess is, uh, you know, two years from now, uh, we will probably come back to pretty much the way we were. Uh, some changes will be made. and uh, But I said, I think the age of innocence is over as far as, as what our feeling of vulnerability to outside shocks. Uh, the, this is partly a function of globalization. You know, we've, we've talked about it a lot, you know, with all the benefits of globalization, but we haven't talked so much about the downsides. And some of those are now apparent uh, because of this COVID uh, issue. Yeah, I agree with all that. I, I would say that we are, you know, we are thinking about the whole supply chain uh, in a way that we haven't for a while. And I think that's generally good, but I do think it is, it is complex. And uh, I think people up and down the supply chains are making decisions based on the incentives that the consumer has at the end of the supply chain. So ultimately we were responding to the consumer's requests. You know, uh, sometimes uh, if the consumer is requesting something like um, animal welfare and the farmers are saying, look, we think what we're doing is better than what you want. There's, there should be uh, a room for discussion of some of that stuff. But I do think at the end of the, the after, after, at the end of all the discussion, the consumer is is always right, and we, the farmers and the supply chains will respond to what the consumers want. Uh, but I think you know, we're, you're you're. I think we've all had time to kind of think about what's important to us on nutrition side, on local uh, supplies, and everybody can make up their own decisions on what they think is important. But I I kind of appreciate the fact that this topic <laughs> was of interest to the alumni and I'm glad I could talk a little bit about what I know about it but there's lots more to learn about our supply chains and I, I think it's worth the investment and especially on sort of some of the herd mentality stuff that hasn't gotten very deeply into it please look at it a little deeper before you make your decisions. Absolutely. Great points. A few more questions have come in. So we have a bit more time. Okay. So um, uh, one question is, given the export position of Canada, where should the next trade deal or reduction of restrictions be invested in from a policy point of view? Hmm. Well, it's difficult. Trade is a two-way street. And of course, you know, people have to want to cooperate on both sides. Uh, my immediate answer a few years ago would have been China, China, and China because there's over a billion people and, you know, they, they really can't produce enough food to feed themselves and their population is still growing. So, and they're also, as they get richer, they're wanting more livestock products, which means more feed grains are being consumed. So, you know, that would have been the number one market. But uh, I don't know, you know, politics being what they were or are, I should say. I wish they were what they were. Uh, what they are today 
uh, there's so much uncertainty in, in terms of these big powers of China and the U.S. and others that I don't know if I have a good answer for that. Yeah, I, I would I would also say that China and the U.S. are you know are big concerns in, in terms of trade, but in terms of what we can do about either of those, I, I absolutely agree that uh, that uh, China is a concern in terms of they they buy lots of our stuff and they shut down for a while some of our purchases. They're back to buying our pork and actually recently we're buying more canola. So I'm not sure how real their threats were because they, you know, Chinese consumers seem to really want canola oil still. So I, I would be cautious of uh, uh, giving them too much just for that trade access. I think the important thing to invest in is our time into the big uh, institutions, especially the WTO uh, or multi you know, big multilateral uh, trade negotiations to give us some new market access. But I think we do want to deal with people who treat us fairly. That's, you know, it's not really much of a, a, a trade deal if it, it's a one way street. So I, you know, I think I think the, the most important investment is in important trade institutions and making sure that they they function fairly. And I do think that we were get, we might see a rise in tariffication and less less uh, kind of agreement on the benefits of free trade and sort of the big investment me might be just to fight off these future uh, trade actions as best we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Very interesting. I don't know if this, this is a sort of a follow-up question to that one, but the question was posted here. Is this the end of globalization? <laughs> no, it can't be. I don't, I, we're, we're not going away <laughs> and they're not going away and, and things will carry on. Uh, I, you know, the, these things come and go. Uh, you know, there was a period of globalization around the turn of not last century, but the previous century in 1900 was sort of the, the first big burst of globalization that came. And, and of course that was uh, quelled by, by conflict that came afterwards. Uh, but there's an ebb and flow uh, with this. And fundamentally though, we're all better off by trade. Uh, we know this, uh, the, the, the economics of this are very straightforward, that specialization uh, lowers costs, gives you better uh, quality products, more supply, and Canada is a trading nation. Uh, we are more exposed than just about any other country in the world in terms of total trade. So I think, as uh, Derek was saying about multilateral uh, uh, institutions, we have a lot of stake or at stake to make sure that markets do stay open, that globalization does continue. Uh, it's only a question of whether, you know, we get pushed around by, by big players or we can, you know, stand up to them. Yeah, I, I agree on the free trade front. I mean, it's in Canada's interest as a generally exporting country to have, uh, you know, have free trade and, and in, in, in the sense that free trade is part of globalization, I think. It's there. The other place where I think globalization might actually grow in this period is is sort of uh, <laughs> we're all getting comfortable to this type of communication and uh, you know longer discussions of things and uh, a lot of information on a YouTube that lasts an hour. And I, to me, the globalization of ideas might see an uptick uh, through this period, partly because a lot of us have time to sit and watch stuff now. It's, you don't commute as much and uh, can't go out much, but uh, I I think you know in a sense some of that is might might grow, uh, but I actually I do think I do fear that we are going to get uh, you know some of that sentiment that we saw on the questions about local food about local food supplies and preference for local that could happen worldwide and kind of reduce the commodity side of, of globalization. Mm -hmm. A few more questions have come in looking at that global perspective. So one of them is, with respect to fighting for free trade, who are our allies? I would have said the U.S. number one ally until three and a half years ago. Uh, and maybe they will be in another half a year from now again. Although they're, they, you know, the, the Americans are very protectionist. I mean, they, they like to yell about how they're free enterprise and so on, but they're actually very protectionist on a number of, of commodities, uh, not just softwood lumber, but sugar and tomatoes and a whole bunch of things that are sensitive uh, to their market. So I don't know if, uh, if, if they will return, 
uh, to being the leader of the of the world in terms of free trade. That was uh, they were the ones who did lead the charge for the last 50 years, and I don't see anybody out there to replace them. Uh, to be quite honest with you. Yeah, they. I mean, in terms of their total economy, they don't export as big a share as lots of countries, and so. And I think that's who we look for in partners is is countries that do rely a lot on exports. Uh, the Cairns Group, I think, is one of the groups that has very similar trade needs to Canada, Australia. Uh, you know, countries like that, uh, especially Australia, it has a very similar, uh, you know, arable land difference and small population. So they've got very similar. Uh, trade patterns to us. But I think just luckily, I think that the, the United States uh, does actually have a belief in free, free freedom sort of generally and free trade to some extent because a whole bunch of those consumers that are buying imported goods want the price that they want. So, you know, so somebody like Walmart can have a have a say in, in a trade policy for the United States because it impacts their their sales. So I think I think the United States is still and just geographically and in terms of our total trade flows, they're one of our biggest trading partners. So, you know, I think they're still a key per, key country to to make free trade agreements with and to work with so that we don't get in the way of our major trading um, movements with them. But I think smaller countries like us that have trade needs are kind of natural partners. There's just not that many. You know, there's not that many that are similar to us. Mm -hmm. and so you, the, go ahead, I, go ahead. I just going to add that the, the new NAFTA agreement or the USMC is going to take effect in a couple of weeks. And uh, that actually helps to secure our trade with Mexico and the U.S. Uh, uh, Mexico has got a very large population and they are getting better off and uh, they don't have that much land. So uh, Mexico will be a long-term partner of ours as well. So the North American trading group, I think is actually gonna be uh, one of those things that we'll be looking more to in the future. Mm -hmm. So you may have already alluded to this, but this question is it speaks to a comparing Canada to other countries. So uh, from a sustainability point of view, how is Canada currently positioned compared to other world export producers? And what are the top three areas to prove on in the next five years? Wow. Uh, well, that, that's, a, uh, that's, a, that's a big question. And there's no short answer for that one. Uh, in terms of how we compare to other countries, uh, I guess you know, a country like Brazil uh, is a, a major exporter, a very large land base, and more could come in. Uh, they're different, uh, obviously, uh, uh, hemisphere, or sorry, southern hemisphere. So they have opposite uh, times for harvest, and, and that actually is complementary to what we do as much as anything. Uh, there are places that could have more agriculture production, and you start applying better technology to a lot of the land areas in the world, and they could produce more product, uh, and, and some could come into more production. So uh, they could be long-term supporters, I suppose. Uh, I'm not sure about the, the three commodities that, or points so Derek maybe you want to try that one yeah I like I I, I think in general uh, if we look at countries like us that are have a good agricultural base and are exporting some of the countries that have done very well with that like Australia and then some of the European countries that are net exporters of agricultural goods they have a bigger budget for agricultural research than us. The United States actually spends a lot of money on agricultural research, but some of it's held in private hands because uh, it's corn companies that get incentives from hybrid seeds, so they have a bunch of investment on the private sector. But a, a lot of their state-based uh, research is pretty messy, and I think Canada actually does some of its agricultural research better than, say, the United States. But I don't think it's as good as Australia or France or the Netherlands in terms of coordination and I do think so we and but we are starting this with the protein supercluster so there is some uh, buy-in from the federal government and industry that we should start building um, you know a critical mass of protein experts and we're starting to see protein investments in Manitoba uh, a plant protein focus that might be uh, you know a real strategic advantage for Canada uh, that those are those are you know huge investments that I don't 
you know, I don't know the outcome in terms of the consumer at the end or, or uh, whether or not the whole industry can move south once it's established. Like we did have some of that in the life sciences where, you know, Saskatoon was actually a center of life science technology and all of a sudden it moved into the states because they could, they had even bigger, um, cl uh, sorry, uh, clusters of, of life science scientists and investment. So, you know, it's hard for Canada to hold on to that because we've got the United States and even bigger economies of scale and even bigger, bigger clusters of human capital investment that, that can swamp us. But I think the, the protein supercluster is a, is a great thing to try. I hope it works. Okay, well, thank you. Those are all the questions we have from our audience. Is there any last final comments you wanted to end with at all, Dr. Brune and Dr. Prentice? <laughs> you know, the old, uh, is the, the safest statement in the world, uh, this too shall pass. And, uh, and indeed, uh, it will pass. Uh, and uh, I think we'll get back to some uh, normality as we saw before. Uh, but, you know, there are lessons that we should be learning. Uh, uh, this kind of event, it does uh, spot, uh, put the spotlight on some of the weaknesses we have. And that's a good thing. Uh, and the, but the issue is whether we actually then act upon them or we just become complacent and go back to the way we were. I, I'm hoping that uh, we'll be proactive. I, I guess my final point is that uh, these supply chains are complex and the consumer at the end has say, but there's all this economic balancing that's happening up and down the supply chain, sometimes thousands of firms between the producer and the final consumer. And that complexity makes it hard for it to respond sometimes but i've been very happy with how we've weathered the storm you know i i had to wait a little bit for toilet paper but other than that my my purchases have been okay okay well thank you i think all of us have had that situation where we've gone to a store and there's no toilet paper for <laughs> So with that, thank you, Dr. Bruna. Thank you, Dr. Prentice, for that very interesting and very timely presentation for answering so many of our questions from our alumni. And thank you to all of you, our alumni, who've been participating today. We will be sending you a link to today's session and to a survey where you can share your thoughts and feedback. Please do provide your feedback as is the only way that we're able to improve. Next week on June 30th, now that's a Tuesday, remember, as, the, as next Wednesday is Canada Day. So on June the 30th, at the same time at 1 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time, our speaker will be Dr. Chris Adams of St. Paul's College and the Faculty of Arts, who will be speaking on Surviving System Quakes, Canada's Political Economy. So if you have not registered for that session yet, I encourage you to go to our website to do so. Uh, also, one last thing I'd like to share with you, I'd like to invite you to attend our virtual convocation ceremonies. They're on Monday, June the 29th, throughout the day. There are four ceremonies throughout the day to celebrate with our, our whopping class of 4,255 graduates who make up the class of 2020 to applaud the accomplishments of the UM's growing alumni community. We now have just under 149,000 alumni living around the world. So please go to our website for more information. Stay tuned to our social media channels for more information. And check out tomorrow's Winnipeg Free Press for a list of all of our graduates and a congratulatory message. So please have a great week and stay safe. Thank you.